Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about drivers with disabilities. We're going to take a step back because I forgot. I kind of I went over that and got into Australia, and I need to go back and talk to you about that because it's important that we talk about drivers with disabilities or people that have disabilities who are learning how to drive with hand controls and those types of things. And I did a lot of that while I was working at uh, Parkwood Hospital in London, Ontario, while I was finishing up my undergraduate degree. I also did some CDL work, drivers, truck drivers, and bus drivers. That's actually how I met Deb, who was the occupational therapist, and did that. And since I already screwed up the introduction, <laughs> we'll just uh, carry on here uh, with the story and whatnot. And uh, if you're just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from and uh, where in the world you're tuning in from. Carrie's here from Minnesota. Sheldon's here. Wheelman is in Portugal and was delivering a load just today, seven hour load coming from the north of Spain down through to uh, Portugal. So we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, one of the other things I, I was talking about, Hall Face is here from Toronto. Uh, just talk to you briefly about uh, Melbourne. I was talking about that yesterday. Matthew's here from Quinnell and uh, Real Deal 350 sent me the link for the roundabout that I was talking about, which is a multi-lane roundabout, and it has a tram going through the center here. And uh, what I'll do here, just bear with me. Here we go, so you can see my screen. And head over here, and you can see here on Google Maps, uh, you can see the link here, and this is the Elizabeth Street roundabout. You can see the driving on the left. The other thing for those of us from North America, uh, a couple of differences. Uh, they do have bike lanes, as you can see here. Uh, they don't have yellow lines that separate uh, traffic going in opposite directions. All of the road markings in Australia are white. And one other, so you can see here, here's the tram, the big orange and uh, blue. It's got <laughs> a lot of uh, advertising on it, as our buses do here as well in Melbourne. The trams are uh, have advertising on them. You can see another one back here, but it's not. Uh, I can just go up here. Oh, and yeah, goofy. Google Maps. I love Google Maps. Here's another tram. Uh, that's an older one. Uh, but you can see they're split uh, up for the runs downtown. Anyway, I got way out of where I was wanted to go. And we'll get back here because there was one more thing that I wanted to show you in the roundabout. Uh, on the sign, of course you can't just get back to where you wanted to get back to, right? Where'd the sign go? There's the sign. So this is the other thing I want to show you. This is the other thing that kind of messes you up in different places in the world. I mean, if you go to Quebec here in Canada, for example, you're going to get Rue, R-U-E, uh, you know, Smith, Rue, Rue Smith, Rue de Smith, <laughs> the street of Smith. Uh, I'm screwing up my French here. And then in Australia, you get Royal Parade, which is another street. Parade, uh, you know, we're used to avenue streets, those types of things, and parade can screw you up a little bit. So that's another thing that is kind of, you know, many different things. And this huge roundabout, multi-lane roundabout with the tram tracks going through the center of it, uh, you know, first time you encounter this, uh, it can be a bit, uh, a bit, uh, you know, overwhelming. You're kind of like, what the heck is going on and am I going to die in this roundabout? You can see also that this roundabout has traffic lights on it. So it's, it's a very complex... Uh, roundabout there in Melbourne, Australia. So we were talking about that yesterday. Get back to the live streaming here. Lightning's here from South Africa, Italio, Oregon. Jaden's here from Florida. Hello, hello. <laughs> Anna, what time is it here? It is 11 a.m. here. Uh, let's see. Jaden, I need to ask you something. Is it illegal to make a U-turn on a solid line because I saw a driver make a U-turn on a double yellow? Yeah, uh, that's not recommended, Jaden. And I would recommend that you have a look here on the video on U-turns. Uh, I go through all of the different uh, places where you cannot make a U-turn. And double solid is generally one of those places that you can't do that. Frederick is here from Denmark as well. So awesome. Sheldon had a question here about... Uh, backing up into a parking space and another driver appears at the same time. What do you do? Uh, I can't really comment on that specifically, Sheldon, because it depends on where you are uh, in the, you know, in the maneuver. Uh, so what I would suggest, if you're unclear at any time of what you should do, Sheldon, just stop. Okay. Okay. The other road user, driver, whatnot, will figure out how to get around get around you and you know you know sometimes you might just have to continue doing your backup or those types of things and what the other driver has to wait for you but it's going to depend on different 
situations and a mentor or a driving instructor can be, be able to help you out with that. Janet's here from Ontario. Hello, hello. Uh, Wheelman, if an airline rupture with complete loss of air pressure and the maxi brakes. Oh, there's an old term there. You're showing your age there, Wheelman. We don't call them maxi brakes anymore. <laughs> uh, jackknifing. Uh, Wheelman, potentially it could. But uh, as I say about air brakes and emergency brakes, okay, so just quickly for those of you, we're just talking about air brakes here briefly. <laughs> air brakes are no different than brakes on your car or truck, light truck. Uh, the only difference between air brakes and hydraulic brakes on your car is the power source. So on air brakes, it's air pressure that applies the brake pedal as you're going up and down the road. Uh, in hydraulic brakes on your car, it's hydraulic pressure. It's it's pressure of fluid, right? We, you know, hydraulic pressure can be any fluid. For example, hydroelectric dams are hydraulic pressure. You simply take water, force it through a tunnel under pressure. It turns a turbine, which in, 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 uh, <laughs> which is connected to a generator. It turns the generator and creates, creates hydroelectricity. It's the same thing with brakes on your car. We use hydraulic fluid. Uh, we have a pump, which is the master cylinder, which is connected to your brake pedal and you push press, uh, fluid under force through the lines and it applies the brakes on your car, simplistically speaking. The other way that you can apply the brakes on your car is with the parking brake. I mean, this is a little bit different now that we have electric parking brakes on passenger vehicles, but on older vehicles where you used to pull up on the handle, it, the energy came out of you. So it was you applying the parking brake. In the event that your brakes fail, which they won't, <laughs> uh, you can use the parking brake as an emergency brake, okay? So that's a simple overview of hydraulic brakes on your car. In air brakes, it's exactly the same, except, so when you're going up and down the road, you're using air pressure to apply the brakes. If you lose air pressure in the system, there's huge springs in the system that apply the parking brakes. So when you come up, you park the truck, the bus, whatever vehicle you have that has air brakes on it, you pull the button out on the dash, it exhausts this, the air from the system and these big springs expand and apply the brakes and hold the vehicle in place indefinitely. So they're called they're parking brakes. The only difference between a, an air brake system and a hydraulic system is, is that on a hydraulic system you apply the brakes manually. On a big air brake equipped vehicle the brakes apply automatically by exhausting the air out of the system. All right. In the event of an emergency and the truck is going up and down the road and you know the driver's asleep at the wheel because there's all kinds of warnings that you're losing air pressure in an air brake equipped vehicle. First of all, you can hear the air leaking out of the system, even over the big diesel engine uh, and over all of the road noise. You can still hear air leaking out of that system. So you're hearing air leaking out of it. The second warning is is at 60 pounds per square inch the low air warning buzzer goes off and it is the most annoying sound in the world. And it goes on. So to not hear air leaking out of the system A and, and not hearing the low air warning system in the vehicle as it's losing air, you, you have to be drunk, stoned, asleep at the wheel to not hear those warnings and get the vehicle pulled over to the side of the road as quickly as possible. And I don't advocate you do any of those things while you're driving a vehicle, any vehicle, <laughs> your bicycle, a scooter or whatnot. Don't do any of those things while you're driving a vehicle. And eventually what will happen, the low air warning comes on at 60 pounds. And the reason it comes on at 60 pounds per square inch is because that's when this, the, the, the emergency brakes start to apply. And when the, Parking brakes, the emergency, they're now the emergency brakes begin to apply. Once it gets to 20, 45, those brakes are gonna come on automatically. And when they come on automatically, you're gonna be doing a bug impression uh, against the windshield and it's gonna come to a stop. Whether it comes to a controlled stop or not, uh, Wheelman, that's a whole different question. But no commercial driver <laughs> should ever have the brakes just pop on automatically. So. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody liked the sound effect. <laughs> yeah, it's a very annoying sound because I've listened to it. Uh, yeah, going back to bus driving, we had the those stupid little hammers, you know, that uh, the emergency hammers that come down and you use it to break the window in, in the event of an emergency in the bus. 
Yes, for three hours one night because we had one of them it was defective and it wouldn't stay. I, you know, duct tape everything else. I tried to get that thing back up there and couldn't get it back up. So I listened to that buzzer for three hours one night. All right. So we got a little off on other talking about driver education and those types of things. But really, that's what, you know, Smart Drive Test is about. It's what we're here for. And if you have any questions about any of that stuff. So Wheelman, did I did I ask ask your answer your question? Uh, you really should never ever get to that point where the brakes are coming on automatically in an air brake equipped vehicle because there are lots and lots and lots of other warnings that are going to tell you that something's wrong far before the brakes uh, apply on you automatically on the vehicle. All right, uh, so drivers with disabilities and, the, and I wanted to back up to my last year of uh, when I was going to university and I was working at the hospital uh, at Parkwood Hospital doing driver rehabilitation, I met Deb in the spring and she had hired uh, one of the driving instructors at the, at the truck driving school to uh, bring a driver out who was a truck driver. He'd experienced an injury and we were doing an, an evaluation with him. And I, I said to Deb uh, when she was there in the truck and we were doing the evaluation, I said, oh, you work at the hospital. She was an occupational therapist. Uh, do you need any, any instructors? And uh, so she said, yeah. So I applied at the, at the, at the hospital. It was a part-time position which worked well for me. And uh, so I went down to the hospital. And I started working at the hospital and they had uh, a car with, a, uh, with hand controls on it. And they also had a van with hand controls on it. And the van was better, be or the van served the purpose that it had a ramp on it. Uh, P drivers with that were in wheelchairs, paraplegics. We didn't work with quadriplegics. You need very advanced technological equipment for quadriplegics. Quadriplegics are, you know, from the neck down, they're paralyzed. Paraplegics are uh, paralyzed from the waist down. So we only worked with paraplegics. They had full control of their upper extremities. And uh, so the van, they could wheel into the van and then transfer because the seat, the driver's seat turned 90 degrees. They could transfer into the driver's seat and then drive the van with hand controls. Uh, so that was for the two vehicles that we had at the hospital. Uh, and uh, the, the, the first experience I had with, I mean, first, first I got in the vehicles and, 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 you know, to see if I could actually drive them with hand controls. And actually, you know, hand controls are really easy to drive. I mean, the car was incredibly easy to drive. It was simply a handle on this side uh, that controlled the throttle and the brake. And uh, you just pulled back on the lever to throttle up. It was an automatic car. And then to apply the brake, you just push the whole assembly forward, which, you know, as you're braking, the vehicle is slowing down. It's causing you to move forward anyway. So it assists with the braking and makes it fairly simple. And you can look up images here on Google and those types of things about vehicles with hand controls. Uh, the car, both the car and the van also had a spinner knob because you know, obviously they're only driving with one hand, people with disabilities, uh, because they're using the other hand to work the, the throttle and the brake on the car. And going back to what somebody said uh, in a live stream, it might have been Katie or Carrie, I can't remember, uh, but uh, that you know, all this farm experience helped me with my CDL license. Uh, a lot of farm equipment, for those of you who may have experience working on farms and driving equipment, tractors, combines, swathers, those types of things, uh, a lot of these vehicles, <laughs> our hand controls. Uh, when I drove on the farm when I was a teenager, uh, we had a hand clutch on one of the tractors, which was incredibly weird, <laughs> having a hand clutch. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the swathers were all hydrostatic, which means that they're driven by uh, oil pressure on the tires. It's not a, a direct link. Uh, and uh, you had to push forward on the throttle with your hand and, you know, steer the vehicle. Uh, another swather that we had uh, was two hand controls and so you know you would push forward to, to make the vehicle go straight and then if you wanted to turn right you would push the right stick forward and pull back on the other one and the vehicle would basically spin around in its own tracks uh, so I had a lot of experience with farm equipment and those types of things driving with hand controls so by the time I got to a hand controlled car and to teach drivers how to drive with disabilities uh, it was it was second nature for me because I had already been doing it for years and years and years and uh, I just got in the car and drove it. I mean, Deb had a, a lot of trouble with it because I, you know, Deb and I worked together uh, assessing students and those types of things. And Deb was a lot of fun. I, I, I was one of those people that I went to work with and just got along with really well. 
And uh, the, the, tough, the tough part about the job, uh, you know, I really liked retraining. I liked helping people to uh, get back to driving after they'd experienced a debilitating injury, whether it was loss of a limb or, uh, you know, they you know, they were in a crash that caused them to become a paraplegic or they had a brain injury, uh, low sight, those types of things. Uh, the most difficult ones were working with seniors who had had something happen to them. We had one gentleman that came in and uh, they caught him going the wrong way on the freeway. He was going down on the on-ramp and out onto the freeway going the wrong direction and they sent him in for an evaluation and I was, you know, I, I said to Deb before he even came in, I said, uh, isn't, isn't that enough that there's something wrong here that this this gentleman's driving the wrong way on the freeway isn't that uh. <laughs> anyway come in for an evaluation and uh, you know we had a closed circuit area in the parking lot and up behind the hospital where we could assess these people and you know if if some of the seniors got into a, into the vehicle uh, you know and it took them 20 minutes to adjust themselves in the vehicle you know, we just took them for a drive around the on, around the hospital and knew that, that they were not safe to be on the roadways. And telling, you know, we had two or three people that we had to tell them that we, you know, we could not approve them to be driving because they simply were not safe on the roadways. And you know, it was it was a hard experience. It was emotionally hard. I mean, some of them. One one gentleman said to us, you know, right in the room, he said, you know, you might as well have signed my death certificate because I can't drive. You also have to understand, keep in mind that, you know, these are the, you know, the first of the baby boomer generation who are getting older. Uh, and uh, this is the first generation in history that grew up with the motor car. And for the baby boomers, it's, you know, having a license is a huge deal. It's a really huge deal. So, uh, you know, it was pretty tough. That that aspect of the job was pretty tough. Uh, <laughs> my friend Ryan, he was he was the first person that I trained to drive to get back to driving and uh, he was in a wheelchair and had a catheter uh, for those of you who don't know catheter is a pee bag uh, that goes underneath the wheelchair because you know they have difficulty transitioning from a wheelchair into uh, uh, onto a toilet so they have a pee bag and uh, <laughs> so he comes in you know it's 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 six o'clock at night that we're having this driving lesson so there isn't anybody else around the, around the hospital he comes in he wheels in and, you know, it was my kind of first experience with dealing with people with disabilities. And, you know, he was really friendly and those types of things. But he, you know, complete, you know, not really the same as us, you know, being grossed out by bodily functions and those types of things. And uh, he wheels into the van. <laughs> we get the chair around, the driver's seat chair around. And uh, he just reaches underneath the wheelchair, pulls out his catheter bag and throws it onto my seat. <laughs> I was like... Oh, I really hope that doesn't break. <laughs> I really hope that doesn't break. So, uh, so we went for a drive, and one of the things that I found out that actually it was one of the few times that it terrified me. You know, he was having some difficulty, and most people who were paraplegics did have difficulty for the first one or two, maybe even three lessons, because now that um, one of the, one of the transitions that is very different for all of the, as they're called, tabbies, temp temporary able-bodied people or people who are fully functioning, driving a car is that you're learning how to work the foot controls, uh, the brake and the throttle with your big leg muscles. For people who are driving vehicles with hand controls, they're, you know, and most of these people had driven before, so we were simply retraining them to drive with hand controls. And the, the biggest thing was to teach them fine motor control, which they had learned with their legs previously when they were driving a car. Now they're, we're teaching them fine motor control to operate the throttle and the brake with their hands. So that was a fairly big transition. And Ryan was having some challenges with that on the first lesson. Of course, I'm kind of new to all of this. And uh, we he made a left-hand turn. He didn't judge the gap completely correct. Actually, it was like one of those near misses that I had. And uh, I'm trying to push the brake on my side, and I realized the brake didn't work on my side. The brake didn't work at all. I mean, it was one of those moments that I actually, you know, one of those very few, few moments in my life that I actually panic, uh, you know, and it, it just didn't work out. So, so that was my first experience driving uh, with somebody else who was driving hand controls. Uh, Carrie, have you ever worked with anyone with high functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome to help them with driving skills? Uh, Carrie, I haven't worked with uh, anybody like that, but I have worked with people uh, not similar, but other kind of, uh, you know, learning disabilities and those types of things. 
there's a for those types of people carry there's a lot of focus on the fundamentals a lot of focus on slow speed maneuvers uh i i taught my sister-in-law for example uh, amelia's sister sarah to to drive and she had a learning disability she had a lot of trouble with it and with her it was not very much driving on the road okay there was some driving on the road but for the most part with her i had to focus a lot on slow speed maneuvers, backing down an alley, going to the parking lot, forward figure eights, reverse figure eights, slow speed maneuvers, backing into parking spaces. And we spent a lot of time doing that. And you know, more than most people would, probably three times as much slow speed maneuvers, backing down and those types of things. And, and people who have those kinds of high functioning autism and Asperger syndrome and those types of challenges, that's what you have to do with them in order to be able to get them to drive safely because they have to have a very high level of understanding where their vehicle is in space and place and they have to have a very high level of controlling the primary controls more so than you know the tabbies uh, the temporary able body people the fully functioning people those of us so uh that's what we did and that's how you do that with other people uh eric beautiful day in the uh, minnesota 60 degrees today is difficult working for uh, loading wheelchairs, electronic or non-powered. Uh, is it difficult working? Uh, wheelchairs, um, it's it's not difficult because most, uh, Eric, most of the uh, vehicles have ramps. The other way uh, that uh, most people who have a wheelchair uh, and want to be independent. Now, some people have a lot of upper body strength, paraplegic, a lot of uh, paraplegics. And I want to say paraplegic, the people, you know, I don't even know how to say that, but people who are in wheelchairs have a lot of upper body strength and they're very capable of getting themselves, transitioning themselves into the vehicle and then getting a hold of their wheelchair and throwing it in the back seat. There are some people who can do that. For people who can't do that, what they do is, you know, they have enough strength to transition themselves in the vehicle, but what they do is, is they'll have, they'll drive a pickup truck with a topper on it and the topper will be on a hydraulics that will lift up to the side and then they'll have a little crane in the back of the pickup truck that they can re work remotely and uh, what they'll do is uh, they'll just hook the crane on and they'll put it in the back of the truck and then the topper goes down. Uh, other, you know, and, and now just going back to uh, elaborate on one more point about people who have strong upper body strength. There was a woman I worked with in, uh, on Vancouver Island and she was fully capable of transitioning herself into the vehicle and then she would what she would do is she would take the wheels off her wheelchair and put each wheel in and then fold the body up of the wheelchair and she was able to get the body of the wheelchair i think she put it in the front seat actually so uh so that's what she did uh in terms of getting the wheelchair in now for people who ha have difficulty you know they don't want to get a pickup truck they don't want to have the little crane in the back to get the wheelchair into the back or as you said they're in an electric wheelchair which are very heavy uh an electric wheelchair weighs out somewhere between 500 and a thousand pounds they're incredibly heavy uh for those people they'll just get a van with a ramp on it and, th and they'll just back right into the van and then they'll transition into the seat so that's the other way that they deal with uh people with uh, wheelchairs, electric wheelchairs, and those types of things. There's many different uh, modifications for those types of people. Uh, Wheelman, those air brake uh, Z endorsements not required in these parts, although I must say it's very well explained in North America safety. Yeah, and it wasn't explained. Uh, air brakes was not a required course in Australia either, Wheelman. Uh, gaming, is it possible for people with spina bifida to drive? If so, have you worked with someone with this disability? Uh, spina bifida um, gaming would would those people be in wheelchairs I'm, I'm not familiar with what the disease is it, it affects the spine and your ability to walk and those types of things I think spina bifida would be similar to people who are in wheelchairs and teach people how to drive in wheelchairs and whatnot uh, Tamara have you worked with people with intellectual disabilities I have an intellectual disability uh, so can you do a video yes Tamara I have worked with people with intellectual disabilities and worked with people who have brain injuries. Uh, interesting enough, one of the, one of the problems, not one of the problems, but unfortunately, one of the group of people that I work with were young males who had had crashes because of drink driving, and you know, just horrible crashes. I had one young kid uh, rolled the car in a field. I guess he lived in the country. He was going home. He he got thrown from the vehicle. 
you know, and their criminal cases are still very much ongoing. And, and for this one gentleman that I worked with, uh, the, the lawyer's defense was is that he wasn't in the vehicle because he got thrown from the vehicle, so they couldn't prove that he was actually driving the vehicle. But, you know, it was, it was you know, as I said to him, we had a very frank conversation one day where we were driving around and, and getting him going again was is that, you know, he was never going to walk again. So, uh, you know, had he already paid his penance. So uh, that was that was basically it. Um, is that you know he was he was in a wheelchair he was very high functioning you know he didn't he couldn't walk but he it was very strong and with his upper body he could ex, he could slide himself into the car drive the car he could get his wheelchair into the back of the vehicle and those types of things so he worked really hard uh tamara how do you teach people with intellectual disabilities it's uh tamara it's what i was talking about before about a lot of focus and a lot of time and energy with slow speed maneuvers and uh, you know, backing up in alleyways and those types of things, and working in the parking lot, backing into um, parking spaces, doing f reverse figure eights, forward figure eights, figuring out where the vehicle is in space and place, and mastery of the primary controls. You want to isolate the skills and abilities that the that the person with the disability needs to learn to because you know it's like because you have a disability because you have a learning disability those fundamental skills have to be at a much higher level before you take those drivers and you put them out into traffic because that ability to know exactly where your vehicle is in space and place and your ability to control the primary controls has to be at a much higher level for these people because they have a cognitive disability because they are not going to react at the same time so you have to spend much, much more time and energy on teaching people with disabilities mastery of the primary controls and where the vehicle is in space and place before you put them out into traffic. That's what you need to do, especially with people with uh, intellectual disabilities. You need to focus on those first. My friend Jonathan is here from New York. Excellent. Hello, Jonathan. Uh, Farron. Great cars for people also with lower body disabilities are Teslas uh, because Teslas can be stopped and moved just with the accelerator and throttle. And, you know, that works, Farron, if if they do, uh, if they, you know, if they're able to use their feet and limbs and those types of things. Uh, but they, I, you know, I don't know, you know, I, I <laughs> my ex-wife had a Tesla and they're selling it and I have not heard good things about how far these vehicles can go and whatnot. And you need, for people with disabilities, you have to understand that you have to have an incredibly reliable vehicle in place because they can't break down on the side of the road, right? They can't get stuck in those types of things because they can't handle emergency situations in the same way that other people can. So I'm not sure that I would recommend somebody buying a Tesla uh, if they have disabilities or special needs in terms of being able to drive. Uh, Epic, have you ever thought to someone uh, an intellectual disability such as autism because some driving schools where I live have accommodations for those who have autism and other conditions. Uh, yeah, no, I need to do some of those videos and I definitely need to hook up with some of the driving schools and other people who are who ha are experiencing that to, to do some videos. We do have a video uh, with Jen who had low vision uh, and that's available here on the website and we, do, we worked with people with low vision as well or people who had one eye and were driving. And people who have one eye uh, don't have any depth perception. So we worked with them as well. Now, the, the people with brain injuries who have experienced brain injuries, and I worked with one gentleman uh, who, just some really awful stories in terms of people with disabilities. He had fallen 70 feet off a silo. He fell 50 feet off one silo onto the roof of another silo, and then he fell 20 feet to the ground. He broke like 22 bones in his body, had sustained a brain injury, lost like 15 of his teeth. Uh, he was the better part of two years of recovering. And I wouldn't wish a brain injury on my worst enemy because, you know, first of all, you're just, you're never right again. And you, there are days that you just, it, it's just impossible for you to even function because your brain simply will not function. And teaching people with, brain injuries to drive again uh, you would go two or three days with you know lessons in a row 
to teach them how to drive and they would be absolutely fine. Everything would be good for two or three days. And then on the fourth day, they would be absolutely, uh, you know, just they wouldn't be able to cope. They couldn't even go to the toilet. And I had one gentleman, Brian, who I was retraining and, you know, we'd gone out for two or three lessons. Everything was fine. And then on the fourth day we went out and he, you know, he's, we're not even out of the parking lot in the hospital and he's driving towards a, like straight for a light standard. I just kind of took the wheel, put the vehicle into neutral. And I, I said to him, I said, Brian, what's going on? He said, oh, I'm not having a good day. I said, yeah, you should have called me and told me that. I said, because, you know, we're just going to turn around and go back. So know that with people with brain injuries, people who are, who have intellectual disabilities, those types of things. Uh, if you're working with them and you know they're showing signs that they're not able to take on information, they're not able to do the work, they're not able to control the vehicle, uh, that you just need to take a break and you need to come back at it at another time. You can't keep just pushing forward as you do with most students, all right? Uh, Wheelman, in these situations of disabilities, an automatic transmission reduces workload? Yes, it does. And this is one of the reasons why uh, some older drivers and other drivers are moving towards automatics, especially in, you know, big trucks and those types of things. Uh, Carrie, with time and practice, no, you can drive too. Quite a few people with uh, Asperger's intellectual disabilities who drive every day. Yes, they do. And you can. And like, as Carrie said, you need patience to work with these people and you need to know that you need to focus on the fundamentals of driving. You need to you need to do that. If you if you don't do that, you're setting them up for disappointment because they're going to get out into traffic, and because they don't they haven't spent the time doing the slow speed maneuvers, they haven't had the time to learn where the vehicle is in space and place, and they haven't learned mastery of the primary controls. They're going to uh, they're they're going to struggle when they get into traffic. So you want them to succeed. So it's better that you spend the time, and I know for driving instructors, I know for mentors that it's boring as crap to work in a parking lot with a driver. It's, it, oh my God, it's so boring. We're not doing anything. Yes, you are. You're helping the, you're setting the driver up for success because when they get into those situations, and obviously when you get out into traffic and you're working with other road users and those types of things, there's other things that you need to do. For example, you know, space management, keeping lots of space so that they have more time to react and whatnot. But you really have to have those fundamentals in place when you're working with people with disabilities. It's so important. And there is my friend, Big Mac Sam. And I am so disappointed that I am not coming down to see you in two weeks, Sam. You have no idea how that is. You know, you're not late for the show. We're, we're talking about people with disabilities and setting them up for success by teaching them mastery of the primary controls and teaching them where the vehicle is in space and place by focusing a lot on slow speed maneuvers and all of the exercises in the parking lot so people with disabilities can do what they need to do. Uh, Tamara, I'm in Washington, DC. Can you please do a video for me to help me pass my learner's permit in Washington, DC? Yes, we can definitely help you out with that, Tamara. Send me an email, rick at smartdrivetest.com and we'll definitely get you going here. Uh, Farron, I know a girl with a lower body, body disability driving a Tesla. She is dry, doing great, but yeah, rather a, get a reliable car. Uh, <laughs> uh, have an SOS on the ready like I do. Awesome. Uh, Carrie, how are you doing? Excellent. Okay. Brilliant. So one of the other, uh, who else did I work with? Oh, the, I'll tell you the story. This is this story is on my autobiography. If you want to go over and have a look at that. Uh, I worked with a native Canadian, and uh, <laughs> we'll call him Sam uh, because it's a funny story, actually. And uh, you know, so Sam came in. Uh, we had a lesson. Went out. Uh, you know, he was he was an amputee, both legs above the knee, and uh, was in a wheelchair. And so we went out in the van because, you know, he was in a wheelchair. He had good upper body strength, so he could get in and out of the van. And got in the van, went out for a drive, and everything went well. And, you know, had a couple of lessons. Everything was going all right. He had finally got funding to get his own van with hand controls and whatnot. And uh, so one day, uh, you know, it was like the third lesson, and we're up the back of the hospital because that's where our office was. Uh, for the driver rehabilitation center and you know I met him out in the parking lot he comes wheeling across the parking lot up under the sidewalk and uh, you know he looks up at me and he kind of points back to his beaten up blue dilapidated van 
And he says to me, you know, I'm really glad I'm getting these, uh, these hand controls. I said, oh, oh, yeah? He says, yeah. He says, I've been driving that for two years with a broomstick. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, just when you think that people are out driving around distracted in their vehicles and those types of things, just, just think of Sam there driving his old van with a broomstick. And how many people are doing those kinds of goofy things when they're driving? So... Sing, uh, hey there, sir, I'm a student in Canada from Calgary and I have a problem in my right side and my hand is not working, but my leg is fine for some extent. Uh, okay. I Sing, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, so you're in Canada, you're, from, you're in Calgary. So Sing, uh, send me an email, rick at smartdrivetest.com and I will look up for you if there's any uh, organizations in Calgary. I think I have some connections with some people in Calgary that work with uh, drivers with disabilities and I can help you out with that. So uh, yeah, definitely. All right, and we'll definitely help you out. Uh, Tamara with the, uh, yeah, with your email there and I'll definitely get you helped out. Yeah, so that was one of the things that I had to do. Uh, yeah, so there's some interesting things at the at the hospital and whatnot. So people with disabilities and whatnot. I had another gentleman that I work with. This is, I'll tell you this last story and then we'll wrap up for the day. Uh, he had been he was a young guy. He'd been having fainting spells and they couldn't the doctors couldn't figure out uh, what was happening with his fainting spells. And uh, he had he had lost his leg below the knee. And I, 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 I asked him one day, of course, I asked all these people that I was working with at the hospital what had happened. And he said, well, he was having fainting spells. The doctors couldn't figure out, nobody could figure out why he was having these fainting spells. And uh, so he'd gone to the doctor. He went home after he, he had another episode. He went home. He fainted in his bedroom. His leg somehow got twisted around one of his dumbbells, like a set of weights. And it cut the blood supply off to his lower extremities, to his foot and his lower leg. And what had happened was is nobody found him for like 18 hours. He laid there for 18 hours with no blood flow to the lower extremities. And because of the low, no blood flow, he, he lost his leg below the knee. And thus he came in and he had to learn how to drive a car with, um, you know, with hand controls. And, you know, just some awful stories of people that had been in crashes and whatnot. Uh, another young male who had been drinking and driving was in the back of a pickup truck. And, uh, you know, the driver was drunk, went through an intersection. He was, he was in the bed of the pickup truck and hit another car in the intersection and then went over the cab of the truck and ended up hitting his head on the curb on the other side of the intersection. And that's, he had a brain injury and I retrained him to, to drive again. Fortunately, you know, that was as bad as it got. Uh, hall phase, what's a, what's a fainting spell? It's like when you black out. So he was blacking out and, you know, collapsing, uh, from these fainting spells. And that's what happened. His leg got wrapped over the, um, uh, over the dumbbell and cut off the uh, blood supply to his lower leg and he lost his leg. Uh, Katie, have you ever worked with someone who has severe hearing loss? Yes, I have worked with people with severe hearing loss and deaf people. We've worked with deaf, deaf people, especially driving truck. Uh, so we've done that as well. We had one gentleman, uh, and you know, hearing loss and, and being deaf is, it, I, I would argue in my personal experience, in my own experience, other, you know, other smart drivers or other driving instructors may have a different experience, but people with hearing disabilities are the most challenging to learn how to drive. And I don't know why that is, but in my experience and, and, most of my experience with drivers with hearing loss has been uh, with trucks. And there's so much of learning how to drive that is auditory. People don't realize this. We don't have a, a lot of focus on the auditory component of learning how to drive. And it's really important. <laughs> there's a lot of sounds that are going on, especially if you're learning how to drive manual. Just ask people who drive manual transmissions. You know, sound is very important. And, you know, for example, I mean, I can stand down on the corner and I can listen to trucks going through the intersection. I can tell you which ones are driving well and which ones are not driving well simply by the sound. So I find it, I, in my experience, I have found it very challenging for drivers with hearing disabilities to learn how to drive. It takes more time. And maybe it might be because 
you know, we're not spending the time that we need to spend as we would with other drivers who are, you know, have cognitive disabilities. Uh, maybe we just need to spend more time in the parking lot, spend more time doing slow speed maneuvers and those types of things. And if I work with people with uh, hearing disabilities, again, I'll do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have done it. Uh, Tamara, thank you so much for doing this video for people with disabilities. I really appreciate it. You are most welcome, Tamara. We'll do what we can to help you out. Uh, Katie, I have severe hearing loss because I'm 80% deaf. Yeah, and yeah, I'm on. And Katie, how do, how do you find driving? How does how does that work for you? Uh, Sing, can you please repeat the email so I can connect with you? Uh, Sing Rick at smartdrivetest.com okay so it's basically the name of the channel and my my name so it's rick at smartdrivetest.com uh wheelman why aren't those class eight rigs equipped with hydraulic retarders in north america very beneficial for new drivers uh wheelman we don't have hydraulic driveline retarders or electric driveline retarders here in north america it's just not industry standard uh what wheelman's talking about Big trucks, buses, and trucks will have a auxiliary braking system on them. So they'll have something to assist slowing the truck on long downgrades. Uh, the, the three different kinds of auxiliary braking systems on large trucks are uh, engine brakes, exhaust brakes, uh, hydraulic driveline retarders, and electric driveline retarders. Now, in, in, in Canada, most of what we have are engine brakes, commonly referred to as Jake brakes. Essentially what they do is they shut off the exhaust ports in the engine, create back pressure, and cause a drag on the driveline. And you'll hear them when the truck's coming down, they go, <laughs> Yes. <coughs> All right, Jake brakes. Didn't do a very good sound effect for the Jake brake. Uh, exhaust brakes, we have those as well. <coughs> and essentially it's just a damper in the exhaust system it creates back pressure in the motor again what wheelman is talking about in terms of hydraulic driveline retarders essentially you take hydraulic fluid force it through a turbine a very small turbine and then you create drag on the drivetrain of the truck the problem with uh not the problem the extra technology in hydraulic driveline retarders is that they run really hot. So you have to run lines off the radiator to cool the hydraulic driveline retarder so it doesn't overheat. And so that's what uh, Wheelman's talking about in, in terms of auxiliary braking units on big trucks. And as I said, in North America, most of them are exhaust brakes or they are Jake brakes. But in North America, or in Europe rather, they will run these hydraulic driveline retarders. And I've talked to lots of drivers who say they're really, really great. Uh, Carrie, thank you for doing this video for people with disabilities. I really appreciate it. You are most welcome, Carrie. Uh, Katie, I find that driving is the same as those who don't have hearing problems. Awesome, so that's really great that you're doing well. Farron, hearing helps with immersion of surroundings, I think. Yes, it does. You know, and there's a lot of things that are going on that we can listen to when we're driving. It doesn't mean that you can't drive without hearing, but I think that it really helps to keep people safe. Uh, Epic, appreciate the video on this one and maybe talk to a driving school who has done a lesson with people with disabilities and my Eric Peck Driving School uh, offers these services. Awesome. All right. So I think we'll leave that there for today. Uh, if you have any questions at all, as I said, send me an email, rick at smartdrivetest.com. More than happy to help you out and get you going, get you driving. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.